next up, we have an incredible speaker, uh, Kristen Smith, who came here all the way from Washington, D.C. Kristen is the executive director of the Blockchain Association. Many of you guys might have seen recently Biden has an executive order on crypto. And so Kristen is leading the policy work for D.C. and also all around the world. And so I'm so thrilled to welcome Kristen to the stage as she talks about the evolution of Web 2 to Web 3. Kristen, over to you. Great, thank you, Clara. Um, and thank you to the Filecoin Foundation for hosting this awesome event today. Um, can you guys hear me okay in the back? There's some issues, let me know. Um, uh, as Clara said, I'm Kristen Smith. I'm the executive director of the Blockchain Association. Uh, I also have the honor and privilege of serving on the board of directors of the Filecoin Foundation's sister organization, the Filecoin Foundation for the Decentralized Web. So really appreciate all that everyone is doing in that space. Um, for those of you who don't know, the Blockchain Association is a trade association based in Washington, DC. And as Clara said, uh, we work on public policy issues. Was very excited last week to, um, for the first time, maybe have six months where we're pretty sure nobody's gonna try to ban crypto because the president said good things and ordered some studies. So this is about the safest we've ever been. Um, but uh, very, we, uh, we have a great team. Um, we work with our member companies to build public policy positions on different issues. We develop, a, develop messaging um, and do education on those issues. And then we have a lobbying and advocacy team that goes and tries to get those policies uh, enacted into law. So everything that, that I work on in Washington, I, I look at through the lens of policymakers because that is the audience that, that we're trying to influence. And I think what's interesting as we think about Web3, which is um, really growing on the radar of policymakers um, in an amazing way, is that policymakers and Web3 are actually codependent. Um, policymakers very much need Web3 to solve the problems that they're worried about. Um, but Web3 also needs policymakers to create the right environment for Web3 uh, to survive. So um, policymakers really don't like Web2. I don't know if anybody's tuned into any technology hearings lately, but if you look at over the past few years where we've had large internet company CEOs go be called before Congress and testify, uh, Congress might not have a great sense of how they make their money or how they work, but what comes across very clear is that Congress is very upset um, and, and other policymakers at the regulatory agencies as well, uh, they're very upset with what Web2 is doing and they want to try to fix it. And um, the reason that policymakers hate Web2 is I think a lot of their constituents don't like Web2 and they're responding to the people they represent. Um, they don't like that these companies are profiting off of other people's data and owning and controlling that data. Uh, they don't like that politically unpopular people are being deplatformed. Uh, they don't like that these large platforms come in and swallow up really good ideas that other people created. I don't know if anybody remembers Clubhouse. That was like big. Who does that anymore? Everybody's on Twitter spaces, right? Like it's, it's, um, it's these companies have so much control over our lives. And if you think about why they have so much control, they actually have economic control because they're monopolies. They all have monopolies over a specific sector um, of, of our internet world, and that's why they have so much control. Um, but if you think about monopolies, uh, they're not new to technology. We've seen different waves over time. Um, if you go back to the 50s and 60s, which not many of us in this room can do, if you needed to have computing done, you had to drive over to IBM and use their giant mainframe computers. You couldn't do that at home. You couldn't, um, uh, you know, you had to go to this one company that had close to a monopoly on computing. What ultimately broke that up wasn't an intervention by the DOJ or the Federal Trade Commission or even an act of Congress. What changed IBM's monopoly was the invention of the microprocessor, which came along and provided an open technology alternative to a large centralized organization. Um, if we fast forward to Microsoft in the 80s and 90s, uh, they had a near monopoly on development of software. Uh, similarly, DOJ tried to come in and break that apart, but what ultimately won out 
was open source software. It was the creation of Linux. It was the creation of the internet. It was, again, open technology that solved the, the concern that policymakers had over Microsoft's monopoly power. That brings us to today, where we have large internet platforms that control so much of what we do. I mean, I don't even leave the bed in the morning without pulling out my phone and looking at Twitter and then, you know, checking my Google search results. And, you know, these platforms have so much information about me. Um, but but um, what ultimately is going to solve that problem and what I think so many of us in this room and here in Austin today are starting to work on is open source crypto networks are the solution to the large platform problems today. So for policymakers who have been struggling to figure out how do we solve these problems, we have now delivered as a community the, the technological and market solution to the things that they care about. So that's why policymakers are starting to love, uh, to love Web3. If, if anybody tuned in to, there was a hearing with some crypto CEOs in the House of Representatives, House Financial Services Committee last December, and I was actually talking to an executive who works at a broader tech trade association who said that was the single best hearing I've seen on a tech issue in years. And if you look throughout that hearing, multiple members of the House asked questions and talked about Web3. They really grasp that there is a new and better internet out there, and they're trying to figure out ways uh, to help uh, foster this and restore the democratic principles to the internet, um, you know, back you know, to its origins of, of having everyone be able to participate. Um, so the good news for policymakers is there's still actually work that they can do on the policy front to foster Web3. It's just not from the antitrust angle that they think um, that, that they sort of came to these issues from. Um, the interesting thing about Web3 is that, like all crypto networks, crypto networks run on cryptocurrencies. So Web3 policy is actually crypto policy. And crypto policy um, incorporates several different issues. Um, one is tax, right? Because cryptocurrencies have all sorts of tax implications. There's questions about who in the ecosystem is a broker. There's questions about clarity for lending crypto. There's question about the taxation of staking rewards. These are all issues that you probably don't immediately think of Web3, but it, getting those issues right are going to help foster the Web3 environment. Um, similarly, securities laws, like what does securities laws have to do with being able to express yourself or monetize your creation on Web3? Um, it actually has to do a lot because if securities laws are misapplied to these crypto networks, then it will add friction into the system and it will delay the development um, of the Web3 space. Um, perhaps the most complicated one, which I think was touched on earlier, are issues surrounding illicit finance. Uh, we're seeing this right now with the conflict between Russia and Ukraine. Um, you know, we have different people that are calling for a crackdown on cryptocurrencies because they might be used to evade sanctions, even though there's zero evidence that this is actually happening. And so we have a lot of education to do to make sure there isn't an overreaction to um, concerns about illicit finance that in turn would harm the development and deployment of Web3. Um, I think the good news though is we have found out that the Web3 community is actually politically very powerful. And I think the origins of that are because we're all used to collaborating in online forums asynchronously. And this really all came to a head this last summer in August when the Senate was debating uh, infrastructure legislation, which had a very harmful provision in there. And um, Senators Wyden and Lummis and Toomey came together with a solution. And the Web3 and crypto community was able to organize really just by sharing information on Twitter. And within the course of five days, we had 41,000 phone calls into the United States Senate supporting the amendment to fix this language. So the fact that without any planning or organization um, and nothing but tools from our friends at Fight for the Future that they put together so quickly, um, we were able to have a huge impact on, on the debate um, in, in relatively short amount of time. Um, so if you are building in Web3, which I think most of you are, or if you're not, I don't know what you're waiting for. Hurry up and get over here and join, join everyone. Um, you know, I think there's a couple things you can do um, to help. If, if you're part of an organization uh, or a company that's focused on this space, um, you know, join the Blockchain Association or support 
organizations like Coin Center or the Digital Freedom Alliance that are um, working to educate policymakers and coordinate the community. Um, I think if you're an individual, the single most important thing you can do is to join the conversation because we're going to have more moments like we did last August where we're going to need to come together as a community and make sure that our voice is heard with policymakers and with regulators. Um, hopefully this isn't something we're going to have to do too many more times, but um, I think August was a pivotal moment that was really, really caught um, policymaker attention and they do want to listen to us. So, you know, be a part of the conversation on Twitter. When you hear or read news that something bad is happening, look for those opportunities. We will make tools available. Um, I'm confident that this community is very quick in getting all of that together based off of what happened in August. And, and I do think that together, um, you know, we can work to influence Washington um, so that Washington can provide the right kind of framework for us to be able to continue to build and to develop and to grow. Um, and so with that, I think, am I handing it back to Clara or? No, I'm handing it to Rachel, um, who I think is going to announce a break. <laughs> so, oh, sure. Yeah. So, so um, it's, it's an election year and um, yes. it's pretty important. Um, what can people, what are, what are the stakes right now? Thing that we're building. Yeah, no, so it's what's really interesting. Uh, the question was, we have an upcoming election. What can we do at this kind of pivotal time to, to make sure that we win? Um, what's really interesting is there are several candidates around the country that are actually running on a pro-crypto, pro-Web3 platform. So we have Erica Rhodes out of Los Angeles. We have Matt West out of Oregon, uh, Morgan Harper out of Ohio, Josh Mandel also out of Ohio. These are candidates that are making it a core part of their platform to support um, to support Web3. Um, but it's not just new candidates that are coming in. Um, it's also existing members of Congress. I mean, there was some great tweet threads the other day by Richie Torres, who's actually a fairly progressive member of Congress, that says we need to be thoughtful about this space. And so, you know, if you're inclined to be politically active, um, I would recommend going to hodelpack.org. They have a list of congressmen and a scorecard that they're in the process of deploying that talks about different members of Congress. So you can, you know, choose to donate to their campaigns um, to try to get more pro crypto people elected. But really, the most important thing I said is, um, you know, be ready to activate when there's a moment to activate, because when our voices are all combined together, I mean, I've never seen anything like this in my 20 plus year um, experience working in DC. This, this, this is a community that's really special, and I think that our ability to activate is our superpower, and that if we do that at the right moments, um, we will ultimately be able to get to a place where we have good policy and, and we'll be able to win. Go. Go team. <laughs> all right, thank you.